You're thank looking you. good. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk today about uh, authentication and authorization and web applications. There's a pretty broad spectrum of topics that I'm going to, to go over today. So not just security, I know this is the security track, but um, I'll also talk quite a bit about identity management. Um, I'll show some code. So for some developers that are that are attending, I think you'll you'll like maybe the code snippets that I'm going to show uh, as well. So hopefully we've got a little something for everyone, including some some comparisons of application architecture. I'll start off, and this is meant to be an introductory uh, talk. So I'll start off with just the basics about cookie security, some basics about application vulnerabilities and web applications as they relate to to cookies and authentication and authorization. I'll talk about some open source uh, projects, OWASP Zap and some of the cheat sheets. And then I'm gonna get into a history of identity solutions. So we'll start way back in the 90s with, with the WAMS, web, app, web Access Management, and talk about SAML and OIDC. And then we'll go through the terminology and concepts associated with OAuth and JSON Web Tokens. I think for anybody who is new to JWTs and OAuth, it, it can be scary at first in part because of there's so much terminology associated with it. Um, but we'll, I'll bring up those code snippets that I mentioned and hopefully show that there really isn't that much coding involved, just a lot of, to learn in terms of, uh, of concepts and terminology. We'll get into uh, to architectures. We'll talk about modern architectures, microservices-based architectures specifically. Uh, we'll, we'll go through some of the OWASP API security top 10 and talk about RBAC. So we wanna talk about uh, role-based access control as it relates to uh, mitigating some of those API security top 10 issues. And after going through the, those concepts and the terminology, then we're gonna get into the uh, actual patterns. So we'll get into real life approaches with, with implementing OIDC and using JWTs. We'll talk about four different patterns or approaches uh, for, for using uh, uh, OIDC and JWTs. All right, in the year of COVID and coronavirus, I've decided to take a lighthearted approach with this talk. As you may have noticed from the abstract that I wrote up, I feel like we could all use a little bit of uh, humor these days. You may not know it, but Cookie Monster is actually a, a notorious cyber criminal. It's not just the chocolate chip cookies that he loves. He loves the browser cookies as well. So he, he loves to perform session hijacking and other types of, of attacks. So I'm going to start off the cookie section just talking about vulnerabilities related to cookie handling. We'll talk about um, session session fixation, session writing, session uh, session hacking as well. So we'll get into some of these different vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, things like that. And then we'll go into the details about the types of cookies. So uh, long-lived cookies, persistent cookies, session cookies. We'll, we'll, I'll explain what it means if it's a wild card or a global cookie. And then we'll look at each one of the cookie attributes and talk about why they are important. I'll end this section uh, talking about mitigation options, and then we'll uh, get into um, then we'll get into the OAuth and JWT section and, and talk about alternatives where there are no cookies involved. So just to start off here, uh, we're going to talk about cross-site scripting. In the bottom right, you should be able to to see the Chrome browser where we're examining a cookie. And you can see that there are certain attributes where there are no values. So for the HTTP only attribute for that cookie or the secure attribute or the same site attribute, those are empty, meaning they are not set. They do not have a value. Also about this cookie, you can see that there is a long lived expiration. So it is a, a month out uh, long lived cookie, which is not, not a good sign. So there's a lot of things wrong with this cookie. The one thing that looks good though is that there is a, a subdomain set. So if you look at the browser bar, you'll see that I have a subdomain that that matches the uh, that, that matches the domain of the cookie as well. And so the reason that's important, we don't want the cookie to be set, sent to every single application that's a part of that that Azure Websites.net site there. Um, so this example is going to show cross-site scripting how it can be used to to steal that cookie. If you look in the the bottom part of that screenshot there, you can see that I have just injected a bit of JavaScript as a URL fragment on that URL, and it, it, it actually worked. The, the cross-site scripting was successful, and so it's showing an alert with, with that cookie. Now, obviously, the old alert example is the classic way of proof of concept. Doesn't do a whole lot. How, how would a cookie monster or, or another um, uh, hacker actually use this in the real-world scenario? Most likely, you would modify the DOM through this JavaScript injection 
you know, this is one way where you could you could add an image to the DOM with the URL and attach that cookie value onto it. So a request would be initiated through the browser and sent to a separate malicious site. This is DOM-based cross-site scripting, an example that, that steals uh, or, or hijacks that, that cookie. Um, for a name cookie, yes, there's some personal information there, uh, but in, in reality, the bigger concern is gonna be about stealing a session cookie. So something that represents the session of the authenticated user, that's gonna be the bigger concern uh, when, it, when it comes to cookie security. Cross-site scripting isn't the only way that a cookie might be leaked or stolen. Cookies and other HTTP attributes are often uh, included in, in request logs. So uh, a typical access log might only have query parameters, but in a full log where we're in production or another, you know, depending on your environment, you've enabled full, full logging. A cookie is just a header and it, would, it could uh, be leaked there as well. Uh, so wildcard cookies, uh, as I mentioned, they are um, they're risky because they're sent to everything that matches that domain. The browser is going to look at the domain of a cookie and it's going to decide when, when and where to send that. So if you have a shared site where you have multiple subdomains, multiple applications on the same site, you want to make sure that you're, you're setting that domain attribute. All right, the reason that this, that this exploit actually did work is because the cookie did not have the HTTP only attributes set. So in other words, the JavaScript was able to access uh, this cookie. Uh, so just simply setting that attribute is, is one way that you can prevent uh, this, this type of attack. So it's, it's effective. And as I'll talk about in a minute, you want to take other steps to reduce the likelihood of, of cross-site scripting. You want to have a defense in depth type of approach. But the, using the HTTP only attribute is a great way of preventing uh, via JavaScript and via cross-site scripting of someone stealing, stealing that cookie value. The domain and path is related to, as I talked about before, wildcard cookies. Uh, you want to have a specific domain there. And expires is bad too for that logging uh, scenario. So if you have a long-lived cookie with a long expiration value set, then it, it's more likely to be um, stolen through, through a log. In the bottom here, I have a screenshot showing OWASP of SAP, which is a dynamic security testing tool. OWASP is a nonprofit uh, education group that has all kinds of information about application security. Uh, you'll see that there are two findings from Zap. One is about the same site attribute and the other is, is the secure flag or the secure attribute is not set on the cookie. The secure attribute means that the cookie is going to be set, sent both to HTTP requests and also HTTPS, right? So if you have a mixed content scenario in your web application where you're making requests to both HTTP and HTTPS, which isn't a great thing to have, but um, setting that secure attribute is going to tell the browser only send this cookie when you're making requests uh, to HTTPS uh, sites that also match that domain value. Same site attribute is the new cookie attribute in town, so to speak. It's, it's relatively new. There are three possible values, none, lax, and restricted. The same site attribute is used to prevent against cross-site request forgery. So let's take a look at what CSERF is. You can see in this screenshot, I have a website, maliciouswebsite.com, and there is a form post present. So there is a, a URL back to my other application that we were looking at a minute ago. It is a traditional form post, meaning the content type is gonna be a form URL encoded. And as a result, when this malicious website makes this request, the cookie that, that pertains to that domain, ISO, ATO, uh, Azure websites, that's going to be sent right along with it. So this demonstrates the cross site from one site going to another uh, and then uh, forgery, which means fake. So this, this shows the cross-site request forgery, also referred to as CSERF or known as session writing. This same site attribute is, uh, would prevent uh, this CSERF type of attack. That's gonna tell the browser that either with lax or restricted, what are the, what are the situations where the, where the cookie should be sent along from one, from one website's origin to another. And so this is one, uh, effective way of mitigating against cross-site request forgery. Now, like I said, we, we, should, we should take a defense in depth approach. Uh, this session is not meant to be about application vulnerabilities. I'm gonna mention uh, cross-site scripting and, and CSERF briefly and how to mitigate against those. Uh, 
uh, for cross-site scripting. Always, always do output encoding. Ideally, you'll have a JavaScript framework like Angular or another one that's going to output encode by default. Input validation is a weaker, but um, it is a mitigation that's that's part of a defense and depth type of approach. There are security headers that can help prevent uh, cross-site scripting as well. And then for CSERF, there are some mitigations which are challenging to implement. Uh, CSERF anti-forgery tokens, where you create a one-time token for each and every form and then validate that on the session side. That is a very effective way of, of mitigating against CSERF, but it's also difficult to, to implement. It could cause trouble with the back button, for example. Uh, one way to avoid CSERF altogether is to use a REST-based architecture. If you have proper REST APIs that take application JSON or, or, or maybe XML type of content types as well, then you don't have traditional form posts. Likely, if you're using REST APIs, you're using JWTs, which will bring us to our next session. Maybe we just don't need cookies. Maybe we can do without them. Um, let's, we're going to think through that and examine that and talk about some different application architectures to see how realistic that is. Um, but, so let's now go into, um, or I'll go into the JWT section in just a second, but just a quick review. If you are going to give a hacker a cookie, then by all means, uh, prefer session, th those session kind of cookies that as, as soon as you close the browser tab or the browser itself, this, the cookie is deleted. Um, don't avoid wildcard cookies. Use the HTTP only attribute so that JavaScript can't access the cookie. And so that'll prevent the cross-site scripting from stealing your cookies. And then use the same site cookie attribute as a part of a mitigation against CSERF. All right, so let's go into a history now of, of OAuth, OpenID Connect, and JWTs as well. Um, I will talk about the predecessors to these types of, of, uh, of concepts and, and frameworks. I will talk, start off talking about WAM and go through these. If you're wondering what the Batman connection is, you know, when I was reading all these specs and reading documentation, I just felt like the terminology here just reminded me of the old Batman TV show with the WAM and the POW. Uh, and there is a WAM in the identity world, and that's web access management. It emerged in the 90s, and I have a, uh, a movie poster for reference just to show how old uh, the WAM came out, even though it's still used today uh, for many companies. You can see that the old Val Kilmer, Tommy Lee Jones, where Jim Carrey was the Riddler, that's around the same time that the WAM standards came out. This was referred to in many cases as single sign-on. It was heavily reliant on, on cookies. And in the time of monolithic web applications, your old traditional ASP and JSP kind of web applications where you were running everything on-prem, WAM, WAM worked really well. Uh, it, it gave single sign-on. It allowed you to do authentication and authorization. Sometimes this was like an agent-based uh, server agent, maybe through Apache or another mechanism uh, where, you, where you could enforce authentication. And it worked really well back in the day. The problem with WAMS is that it is session full, so to speak, meaning all of those cookies and those session cookies are an actual session that is stored in a database in most implementations. So that means for a, a big enterprise using a WAM, you could have millions upon millions of entries in a database. And of course, there's gonna be scalability and performance issues uh, when, when you have that many number of active sessions. As a result, as, as uh, development teams started moving towards microservice-based architectures. It was common for folks to have issues with WAMs. You could hit max session issues. There could just be um, timeouts and trying to verify that a user is authenticated when making REST API calls to the WAM. Uh, it didn't scale well, and as a result, there have been outages and issues and problems, and folks have started to move, move away from, from WAMs. Uh, I want to I want to elaborate just a bit about microservice-based architectures. You can think of a traditional web app that was maybe you know a, mil uh, a million lines of code, let's say, and and maybe a team has modernized and then refactored or, or rebuilt, and so there, there's now a dozen microservices instead of that one big monolith. That that example shows you know you need an authentication token for each one of those microservices. There's more uh, clients and, and API calls going back and forth. There's just more sessions. That, that shows how, uh, for a microservices-based architecture, a WAM is not a good solution. Also, once you get into cloud environments, uh, you have a hybrid architectures or you have cloud-based systems, an on-prem WAM 
uh, is just not robust enough to, to meet needs of, of modern solutions. All right, so in the 2000s, SAML came out. SAML also referred to single sign-on. It's one of the reasons that single sign-on is such a <laughs> confusing and, and overused word, but um, single sign-on refers to a, a lot of different implementations, SAML being one of those. XML-based, uh, SAML allowed for software providers, you know, as, as more companies were starting to um, uh, buy instead of just build everything themselves, they're gonna buy solutions, run it, run it on-prem. SAML allowed them to have that same single sign-on experience uh, in, in a way that you know, was great for users and also very secure. SAML is still very popular today, works really well. Uh, in the late 2000s, and this was around the same time the Batman, the very first Batman Begins movie came out, which was a trilogy. Um, that one made me feel old because was I remember that very clearly when that one came out <laughs> and how great it was. Um, the first version of OAuth came out, and there have been two versions of, of the OAuth standard. Version two was not backwards compatible with version one. It was really like a redo, and then there have been many uh, standards since, but OAuth was much more geared towards uh, REST APIs, uh, and then uh, once OIDC, the OIDC standard came out, and JWTs, and things like Pixie, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, once these, these newer RFCs were released, um, OAuth v2 became a very appealing option that worked for a great number of, of companies. Some of the things that were introduced in the OAuth v2 and OIDC standards were ID tokens and JWTs. There, there's really a collection of these, but I'm going to talk about them as a group. Um, ID tokens, where you have a JWT for, for client-side apps, access tokens for server-side. Uh, this was authentication-focused. Many cloud-based identity providers also implemented authorization capabilities through JWTs and OAuth. And I'm going to have examples of this in a minute. Um, some great things about, about JWTs, uh, you know, it, it, it's a smart token. It has information about the current authenticated user in it. And obviously you don't want to have too much information or, or sensitive information in the JWT, but you can include current user information there. So it's really useful. Uh, it, it, and it felt, felt right for a REST API type of architectures with single page apps. It really was meant for these modern types of architectures. So what are JSON Web Tokens? They are very cool, like the original Batmobile and JWT is the sound that the Batmobile makes when it fuels out, in case you didn't know. Uh, like I said, JWTs do contain information about the current user. They're really just JSON, and JSON is just JavaScript. It is Base64 encoded JSON, uh, meaning there's a, there's a standard uh, format uh, of this JSON. It's encoded, and so that can be passed around easily. Uh, JWTs are sessionless, so opposed to WAMs, which are session full and have those giant session databases in some cases, JWTs are sessionless tokens, meaning uh, you don't have to store them in a repository. And you might be wondering if you're not familiar with JWTs, well, how does one verify that a user is authenticated if it's not stored in some database? Um, in a traditional WAM, you're calling like a REST API with a, with a cookie value in order to say, is this user authenticated? Are they authorized? With JWTs, there is a public key and a private key uh, that's used to, um, the private key is used to create the JWT and the public key can be used to, to verify that JWT. These are generally issued by the identity provider. So your cloud-based identity provider, or if you have one on-prem, um, that would be responsible for issuing the JWT. And, and as a result, it's responsible for, for maintaining that private key, which is so important to protect. One of the side effect benefits besides the, um, you know, the security benefits of using JWTs is that it reduces the number of network connections. So a, a server-side application doesn't have to make that request back out to the identity tool. It can use that, that public key over and over again to verify that the user is authenticated. Here's what a JWT looks like on the right. That's Base64 encoded JSON. On the left, I have decoded that, that JWT, and you can see the key value pairs, which are known as claims. So you have your name and your value pair, and you can see that it has some useful information about me, although I um, blocked out some of that useful information. Uh, it also, I wanna highlight that there's an expiration, and this is one of the big benefits of JWTs. If you're using one of the um, commonly cloud, common cloud-based identity providers, and there are a lot of options, by default, these JWTs will um, have an expiration within an hour or two. 
And in some cases, and I've worked with a few of these identity providers, you don't have the option to change it because you don't want to have a long-lived JWT in part because it's sessionless and there, and in some cases there isn't a way to, uh, to say, oh, this JWT has leaked. I want to um, expire it. I want to make it so it's no longer usable. You need to have a short expiration on a JWT and that's the default. All right, so the joker, if you will, is your JWK and that is the public key, which I have already mentioned. You can validate your JWT with a public key for many uh, cloud-based identity providers, that, uh, that JWK will be publicly accessible. It really is okay to have that open to anyone and everyone. Both the ID token and the access token can, can be va validated um, with, with uh, JWK. All right, so one of the great things about OAuth and OpenID Connect is that you, it, it supports many different types of clients. Uh, in OAuth terminology, you have OAuth grant types, which are more or less um, used by these various types of clients. So opposed to the old WAM types of approach, you have, uh, uh, if you're using a, the, a cloud-based identity provider that has the full OAuth OpenID Connect spec that it's implemented, you're gonna be able to support lots of different client types, including mobile devices, um, be able to do things like integrated Windows OAuth, and e even be able to do, um, you know, more advanced like Internet of Things type of situations. So because of time, I'm not gonna be able to talk about all of these. I'm gonna highlight just a few of them. One of them is Pixie, which is proof key code exchange that's used by single page apps. I'll talk briefly about the authorization code grant type, and that's for traditional web applications. And then I'll talk about the password grant type, mostly because I feel like the password grant type gets a, a really bad rap, but there are some times when you just, you have to use it. Um, the, the oboe one is interesting as well. It is a way to do server-side token exchanges. So one great thing about JWTs, uh, it's gonna encourage you to have JWTs per application or group, logically related group of applications. So instead of one cookie for lots of applications, which is a risk, because you know, one app might have a vulnerability that allows that cookie to be leaked, we're now gonna have JWTs for, for one application or one or one group of, of related applications. So there's gonna be cases where you need to exchange your JWT for another one. And we don't wanna have a negative user experience where we're having people re-prompt over and over again to, be, to, to log in. So I mentioned Oboe is the server side way of doing token exchanges. Pixie is the client side way of doing uh, token exchanges. So Pixie is proof key code exchange. Some of you might be familiar with the implicit grant type, which appeared in an earlier version of the OAuth spec uh, for, for all purposes, and for, especially for security people, uh, we should consider the implicit grant type deprecated. Almost, well, the cloud-based identity providers that I know of support Pixie already, even though it's relatively new. And I think that the next OAuth spec iteration or version will likely have Pixie as the go-to option for single page apps and it will deprecate. So what is Pixie? It is a two-step process initiated from a UI, usually via some JavaScript, that's gonna have a, a redirect uh, for the user to go to the identity provider. They will log in, it could be multi-factor, uh, you know, it, it just depends on what's configured on the identity provider side. Um, but there's a two-step process. The one is the redirect to the authorization endpoint. And then the next one is to go back with, with a randomly generated token that comes from the IDP and go back to uh, go back to the token endpoint. If that all sounds super complicated and, and anybody is scared, um, don't worry. Uh, this is all um, provided by, by JavaScript libraries of the, of the identity providers that I've looked at. They have JS libraries and, and I do most of the heavy lifting for you. And I'm gonna show a code snippet in a second. So this is some conceptual background information um, if you're a developer, it, it could be just as easy as using, you know, importing the JavaScript library and making use of it, not having to know all the nitty gritty details. Uh, so once the UI or the single page app has a access token, which is meant to be used for server side calls, the UI would initiate an Ajax REST API call going through an API gateway in this case. Uh, the API gateway is gonna use that JWK public key that I mentioned earlier. It's gonna heavily cache that public key and the API gateway is going to do the JWT validation. If all is well, then traffic will continue proxying to the underlying API. One of the valuable things that I mentioned before is 
is Pixie Silent Reauthentication Support, where uh, through that JavaScript library, you can get a new token as long as the user uh, is authenticated to your identity provider and, and has that session that's already established. From the spec itself, I wanted to just to show, uh, this is from the, the RFC original one for, for proof key code exchange. You know, that's that two-step process. But fear not on the development side, there's easy ways in order to, to do this silent reauthentication. And uh, there's similar examples for different identity providers. But if you need a silent token, it's gonna get that for you automatically, no pop-up, uh, no, no redirect. You know, sometimes you've seen uh, like, a, like a quick redirect flash back over. That's not gonna happen here. Implementations vary. Sometimes identity providers will like inject a hidden iframe, perform this authentication operation, uh, and then to get that JWT and set it back, usually in HTML5 session storage. If that doesn't work, if it doesn't, uh, maybe the user's um, uh, session with the, with the cloud tool has already expired, then you can, in your error block here, say, okay, we'll do the pop-up in order to have the user re-authenticate, um, or, or maybe it's a redirect, whichever one that you prefer. One of the benefits of using Pixie and going with a standard approach with OAuth and OpenID Connect and using JWTs is that you have much better tool support. So using a, a legacy WAM or a le legacy on-prem identity tool um, that has some custom authentication capabilities, you're, you're not gonna have this kind of tool support. This is one thing that developers have really enjoyed. Also, it's great from a security standpoint. If you're doing security testing, for example, um, you can even set up Postman as a proxy and use your OWASP Zap or use your, your Burp or whatever your DAST dynamic security testing tool is and, and still get pretty good test coverage of your Rust APIs. You're just doing this step through Postman in order to easily get back your JWT. All right, next up is password grant type. And I do feel like password grant type gets, gets a bad rap just because um, it, it has been misused, and that has led some folks, I think, to say never, ever use password grant type. If you have a cron job, batch job, something like a daemon kind of thing that runs once an hour, once a day, once a minute, whatever it might be, using the password grant type, it, it, it can be a viable option. The other one is the client credentials grant type, but um, depending on your identity provider and how they've implemented client credentials, you might want to use the password grant type. In that case, your cron job will have a set of a username and password in addition to a client ID and a client secret. I would always recommend using a password vault, not hard coding credentials, of course. Uh, so if you have a password vault, we can programmatically pull down those credentials. That's great. Uh, then the password grant type, as far as the OAuth flow goes, is you're going to be sending along those credentials, the client ID, the client secret. You're going to go to the token endpoint in order to get your access token. Because this is a server side, there is no ID token. ID tokens are meant to be used by UI. So you can, you know, within your UI say things like welcome user or maybe pre-fill a form based on the authenticated user's information. Uh, you just need an access token in this case. Same thing with calling the API gateway uh, uh, or calling the API, which goes through the API gateway and the gateway does your, your token validation using the public key JWK. You can use Postman for the, to test the password grant type as well. It's a great, great free tool. Uh, you can also use curl, of course, or, or another way of initiating an HTTP request. This just shows that you, you know, you're sending your username, and your password, and so on. This is fine to use password grant type, uh, in my opinion, for this particular use case. The problem is when people say, well, I don't understand the Pixie flow, or I don't understand authorization code, and so I'm going to create my own login and use the password grant type and have people enter in passwords. That's where you're going to get in all kinds of trouble. Uh, when web applications have to handle passwords themselves from a UI standpoint, especially, there's just all kinds of ways to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, so just if you're going to use password grant type, just use it for this, this cron job type of approach. Okay, so that was a lot of concepts and terminology about OAuth. I hope I didn't lose anybody there. We're going to get into some more concrete things in a little bit. Uh, one, one, one more piece of conceptual thing that I want to cover is RBAC, role-based access control, and what does that look like with OAuth and JWTs? So I'll talk about that first, talk briefly about the OAuth API security top 10, and then I'm going to get into specific usages of JWTs. All right, so, so RBAC. Uh, 
Okay, so we in this diagram, I'm showing an identity provider. I have a single page app UI, an API gateway, and an API. So with your identity provider, uh, this, is, this is known, at least in this context, as a policy information point. The, and one of the advantage of, advantages of using a cloud-based identity provider, it's going to have a beautiful kind of UI where you can define your, your roles, your groups. You can map users and groups to roles. The reason that's important in the context of OAuth and JWT is that you can have a roles claim on your JWT. So just like when we looked at the JWT before and you saw those key value pairs, we can have a roles where the identity provider is also acting as the policy decision point to say, I'm gonna create you this JWT and I'm gonna populate it with roles based on how you've mapped users and groups to roles through the identity provider UI. Of course, there's a CLI and a REST API as well. Um, so there we go, policy information point, policy decision point. And what's doing the enforcement though? What's actually gonna make the yay or nay decision? That's the API gateway. It's your policy enforcement point. That's where you would have your authorization rules. And I'm gonna show, uh, show this in just a second. You'll have your authorization rules where um, you can say a, a, a person with a admin role can make get post puts and deletes to all endpoints, or a person with just a reporting role can just make get requests. You know, that's, that's the kind of authorization rules that you can define at your API gateway layer, and that's your policy enforcement point. I will say that by using a cloud-based IDP, you can uh, 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 just leverage the fact that they have implemented these specs to a T, uh, things like Pixie and, and JWT and OAuth, and you're less likely to shoot yourself in the foot. I will say that I did shoot myself in the foot at one point in time when I tried to implement sort of an identity solution myself didn't realize what a can of worms that was and all the things that can go wrong. For example, how to properly protect that, that so important uh, private key um, when using uh, RST56, the signing algorithm that's asynchronous and has the public key and a private key. You know, those are things that the IDP can handle for you, um, which I would highly recommend. One of the many resources that OWASP provides is this API security top 10 list. It's relatively new. There's been an OWASP top 10 for many, many years. The API security top 10 came out, I think last year. Uh, you can see that three of these top 10 issues are related to access control. There's broken authentication, there's broken object level access control, and there's missing function resource level access control. And I wanna highlight API 5, broken function level access control. This is worth a read for sure. Complex access control policies with different hierarchies, groups, and roles, and unclear separation between administrative and regular functions. These lead to authorization flaws. So if you're using an API gateway, uh, it becomes your policy enforcement point. It helps you do this function level access control by checking the JWT, checking those roles. Um, it also allows you to do a number of other uh, policies like rate limiting that I'll talk about but I mentioned act cross-site scripting before, you can do some basic input validation at the API gateway, similar to what you would do in a WAF, like a web application firewall, um, but this is API specific. Here are those roles and those authorization rules that I mentioned before. You have your roles that you've defined in your cloud-based identity provider. Then you can do some fine grained rules here saying, if you're an admin, you can do get post puts and deletes. And if you have a role like app reader, then you can just do gets. Uh, I think that this quote is just spot on for if for teams that have switched away from monolithic web applications, they've moved towards REST APIs. I think what folks have observed and what I've seen for sure is that things that used to be private methods or private parts of the application uh, of the monolith now is exposed because in a REST API architecture, everything is a REST API endpoint. So you need a way to say, some of these REST API endpoints are only for admins, some are for those with the writer roles. You, you need some kind of way to do function level access control. I didn't wanna talk about rate limiting since I'm talking about an API gateway. How does this relate to JWTs? With a JWT, you're, you can easily do fine grained rate limiting. There are pitfalls associated with rate limiting. Like if you had a shared key that lots of users were, were, were sharing in, in order to um, send that along and you were rate limiting based off of that, you could have one user, a misbehaving user who's making lots of requests. Maybe it's a misbehaving batch job, for example, that just sent a million requests uh, per minute. Uh, you know, that, that would block everybody else and based on a rate limiting policy that's based off of, X, uh, of API keys. Uh, 
So as a result, you want the most fine grained rate limit that you can apply. A JWT has those attributes like email that's typically unique. You can rate limit not off the JWT itself because the user could just re-authenticate and get a new JWT over and over again. Uh, you can rate limit just off of the email because that's going to stay the same no matter how many JWTs they get. All right, so that first pattern that I talked a lot about was, was REST API architectures. Microservice architectures are, are very common and, and it's used so frequently. I'm going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, one, one other thing that most enterprises will have is a content management solution, at least one. Maybe you have more. This could be WordPress. There's a bunch of other vendors as well. Uh, if you have an Apache fronted type of content management system, then using this, this open source Apache mod OIDC uh, module could makes a lot of sense. So this works with several identity providers that has them listed out. If you check out the website, it provides authentication and some authorization capabilities. Uh, it also does refreshing of JWTs automatically, which is really nice. And then even for the, the underlying application, it's gonna add an extra header. So the underlying app will know, you know who, who the current user was. So that's sort of like a convenience thing, but this is a great open source project. It has a, a lot of support behind it as well and worth checking, checking out. So many, so much uh, buzz still around Kubernetes. It's become such a common application runtime. The, the Kubernetes ingress, which by default is gonna be based on Nginx, it has uh, extensive support. It's, it's incredibly robust and I continue to be surprised by, by all the things you can do with, a, with an ingress in Kubernetes. Uh, this is essentially the same as, as the Apache that we were just looking at. It is a, it is a, a, a proxy. Any and all traffic is gonna pass through this ingress before getting to the, the underlying application which is running in, in Kubernetes. As you can see here, I have some args specified. So you're gonna have your YAML, your deployment YAML, your ingress YAML. You're gonna use some Nginx annotations on your ingress YAML. The deployment requires some configurations. Uh, this, this project, by the way, is recommended from the, the Kubernetes uh, website. Um, uh, I meant to have the actual name, the actual name as well on here, but if, if you go there to the Kubernetes site, it'll redirect you and uh, or point you to the right, uh, the right place. You are going to configure some args, such as your identity provider, uh, your cookie name, but also those cookie attributes. So this is a cookie-based approach. After it authenticates you using OAuth and it, it's using the authorization code grant type, which is why you need a client secret as well as a client ID to configure this. It's doing that server side. So it's more of a traditional type of authentication approach because it's using authorization code. Um, and it is going to set a cookie. But this, this is a great solution, also works with a bunch of identity providers, uh, and, and it seems to be pretty robust. And again, there's a great community around this project. I realize this is an open source con conference, but I did want to talk about the fourth pattern of not using uh, open source projects and instead going full cloud. Maybe John, if I can jump in real quick, just a five minute warning. Okay, thank you. If you're going full cloud, meaning you're deploying your applications, your identity tool, Everything is going into one of the big three clouds is what I'm referring to. If you are uh, doing that, then yes, it might be easier and faster. Of course, there's gonna, you're going to pay for that pleasure of going so fast. You, you will have the luxury of a single integration window, uh, which is really nice. You know, you can often configure authentication authorization. If it's the REST API, you can often even do the um, API gateway configuration all within that single pane. So that's something that can be really convenient, um, just less tools, simpler as a result. I, in my experience, you are really, um, you, you have to use what they provide for you. There's not a lot of extensibility. There's not a lot of customization. So one of the questions is what's the, what's the way to go? Should you go a full cloud approach? Uh, I mean, it really is gonna depend on a number of factors like your budget. Um, where should you use open source? What I have found is that using a cloud-based identity provider, because it implements the specs, because it forces you into good security postures, things like expiring your JWT after an hour, that going the identity cloud approach makes a lot of sense. Using enforcements, whether it's the open source API gateway, at, you know, at the Apache layer, the Kubernetes ingress, doing the enforcements and the essentially the authentication verification of your JWTs, there are a lot of open source projects for that. And I think that 
that approach uh, works well. All right, so to wrap up here, we started talking about cookies and traditional architectures. Then we went into microservices based architectures. The question is, should we avoid cookies? Are they so problematic that we shouldn't use cookies anymore? It's tempting just to say, you know, no, let's just not use cookies. But realistically, you're going to have content management systems. You're going to have other types of web applications uh, where you're going to want to use cookies in certain situations. Not everything is going to be a REST-based architecture with a single page app with a, with a JWT going back and forth. Um, OAuth with JWTs, it, it strikes me as more modern and more robust. You can support advanced clients type, client types, Internet of Things, mobile apps, things like that. Definitely, there's a ton of terminology and concepts, but fundamentally, I think, as long as you're not taking a do-it-yourself approach to OAuth and JWTs, rather you're depending on a reliable identity tool, I think that the that an OAuth approach with JWTs is going to be more secure. Either which way, though, uh, whatever direction you choose, I think that you, you're going to have to do your, your, your security reviews, your pen testing, you're going to have to look for application vulnerabilities, uh, you know, things like security headers, those other cross-site scripting preventions, um, all of those things are, are still, still a must, but I think as long as you adhere to those um, security, uh, cookie security best practices, or, or you go with an OAuth JWT type of approach, then Cookie Monster is going to be really sad because he's going to have a hard time. Uh, he's going to have a hard time session hijacking and stealing cookies and, and impersonating users around the web, website. All right, and that is the end of my slides, and I'm happy to take a look at the, the questions now, if there are any. You know what, I, I think it would be good, uh, Sean, if you could jump into the chat room and answer questions there. Okay. Kind of like a quick Slack channel kind of thing. Um, also, Justin, if you could cut and paste your question into the chat channel also, Sean can answer there. I think it'd be good. Um, Sean, as you're thinking about this, what is the one major thing you'd like people to take away from this presentation? Yeah, I mean, I, I hope that people uh, learned some things about OAuth and OpenID Connect and JWTs and thought about uh, how, how your, uh, your applications are approaching authentication and authorization.